This week, Adam and Jason join me again for another Critiquing Comics. The comics are Clover and Cutlass, a Dungeons & Dragons-related YA comedy by Toby Boyd, and Coiled to Strike, an anthology book with different takes on mysterious Wild West anti-hero Emery Graves, also known as The Viper. As always, a reminder that you can support the podcast by pledging a few bucks a month at patreon.com slash deconcomics. Or if you'd rather give a one-time donation, you can do so via PayPal by sending it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We appreciate your support. This is Tim. This is Jason. And this is Adam. And this is Critiquing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Tim in Tokyo, and uh, for the first half of the show, I've got Adam in Nagoya. How's it going? It's going all right. I'm a little bit tired. I I um I have a friend who lives here in town, and he has a retro game bar, and I went to his bar last night and stayed way too late playing video games and getting drunk, so. <laughs> okay, on a school night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't have school, luckily. But... Or a work night? Mm. <laughs> yes. Not only is it a work night, I had um, a pretty big, important meeting today that I didn't was not prepared for because I stayed up too late doing that. But I don't know. Uh, so we're talking about a comic called Clover and Cutlass uh, by Toby Boyd. Um, it's kind of a fantasy, well, in the about on the website, uh, which I'll link to, of course, uh, it says it's kind of in the pattern of Dungeons and Dragons. I don't really know anything about Dungeons and Dragons. Um, yeah, and neither do I. Kind of a YA comedy feel, kind of, kind of like <sighs> manga through an American filter a little bit. Mm-hmm. I see that. I sure. Yeah, I see that for sure. And I think a lot of the comics that younger Americans are doing kind of have that feel to them. Yeah, I feel like I'm, I feel almost like a broken record because I say this almost every time we review something, but I feel like it also has like a Cartoon Network kind of thing, like a it Adventure looks like Time. Steven Universe or Adventure Time. Yeah. And, yeah, I was just about to say that too, Adventure Time. <laughs> yeah. And I, I obviously, I think that that is that whole style of, drawing and storytelling is you know really really influential to a lot of people so Mm -hmm. i I guess that's why it comes up all the time but i definitely see the manga influence as well in this for sure Mm -hmm. yeah well i don't know for sure but i would guess that manga was an influence on adventure time so i think we're kind of getting getting a direct manga influence and an indirect manga influence at the same time here yeah, it's like a Ouroboros or whatever those things, a snake eating its own tail. Mm-hmm. So you said this was based on Dungeons and Dragons, and I think it's actually like quite literally based on that because there's a, in the notes between chapters, I think the writer had mentioned that this was based on a D&D campaign that they were doing and, or a side quest from a D&D campaign that they were playing. And then when they finished this story arc, they would go and, create the the comic based on the main story that they're doing in D D. so and i have heard mm. i've heard of this as a thing like people will play D D because it's a really good creative exercise for like right that story writing muscle mm. and you know because it puts you in a really creative space I, I, like i said i have never played dungeons and dragons so i don't really know much about that but but i think that's where this story comes from mm-hmm and as the about page mentions, which I'm looking at here, there's also an LGBTQ aspect to this, which I think is almost as common these days uh, as the manga influence in thing, comics done by younger creators. Yeah, for sure. And I noticed that as well, because I think one of the characters has two dads. And I think, you know, the, the main, I don't know if she's the main, but one of the main characters. Yeah, Maggie. Maggie. Um, she mentions it, being gay and trans. I was like, okay, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But and, also that they mentioned specifically that her pronouns are she, her. So, right. So she's, you know, 
<clears throat> I don't know. I'm, I don't know if she's, if she's trans, like that's trans and became he, she, or I mean, sure, she, her. Uh, I'm just going to stop before I say something. Yeah, what is like that being he, she? I'm not familiar with that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a little, I don't know, for me, having been in Japan for 35 years and not at all a young person, it's just like, kind of like, oh, this is a completely different world from <laughs> from what I'm familiar with. Yeah, um, you know, and I, I think that, you know, the, the comics that probably, I mean, we're not exactly the same age, but the kind of comics that were, you know, that I was reading even the ones that were kind of independently created, they were not at all like this. They weren't very colorful and bright. They weren't, um, you know, they weren't as cartoony. There was more of like an attempt at realism, I think, for a lot of like the indie comics and stuff that I was reading when I was Hmm. a young person, quote unquote. Um, And so I, you know, I think that there's just obviously they're coming from a totally different influence base, but also like the medium itself, you know, when I look at this comic and the, you know, the notes in between chapters, there's comments from readers online. And then the artist has drawn some, you know, response to that. And so there's a much more interactive kind of thing going on. It's all, online the tools that they're using are mostly digital um, which means that there's no limitations no budget limitations for making it in bright beautiful colors Mm -hmm. whereas the comics that i was making back in high school and and even afterwards were all photocopied to kind of save money you know and stuff (laughs) like that so um so like the whole aesthetic and then also just like you said the whole world of for example being It's not that the comics that I was making were necessarily non-gender inclusive or whatever, but like now there's a deliberate attempt to put that kind of stuff in and to make sure that everybody feels welcome and included in the storytelling, you know? So, Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, I welcome that for sure. Uh, But like, you know, I agree with you. It's not at all like the kind of comics that I came up reading or, or making myself. No. I mean, I I was when I was like in high school, I read Marvel. That was that was the comics I read. Marvel, well, and <laughs> newspaper funnies, uh, yeah. but not much else. Uh, so yeah, this is completely different from my comics influences. Um, and also, that was the day when I thought I would probably never meet a gay person, but <laughs> little did I know that I actually knew some at the time. Uh, but yeah. you know, you didn't come out with that back then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's funny because it's one of those things where people, people of older generations might be like, well, why is everybody gay now? And it's like, well, there always were. <laughs> There's right. The concentration yeah. has not changed at all. It's just the ability to come out. I admit in my foginess to feeling that way sometimes too, like, are, is anybody still straight? But yeah, it's just that it feels that way in comparison to what I grew up with where you everybody was straight cisgender or yeah. or else you assumed that they were because they weren't telling you otherwise exactly exactly yeah uh so a little bit about the story yeah we mentioned the character margaret she's some kind of i don't know an orc maybe she's got the little yeah. fang teeth i i can't tell and she's i mean maybe she's like mixed because i think that she looks more like her mother which is her mother's like a crazy beast or something. I don't know what she is, but her dad seems like a very, almost like a human, right? Uh Uh-huh. And everybody's afraid of her mother and her mother wants her to kill, you know, to make sacrifices and kill Mm -hmm. um, for, for their plan. But the dad is this very like compassionate, loving character. But at the same time, he's trying to summon, you know, this, like basically demon to bring about the apocalypse. Right. So, <laughs> right. Hmm. Yeah. So that scene, I guess it's in the first chapter. I don't know. So it's, he's trying to play it for comedy that, uh, she's, 
Margaret Maggie is un- uncomfortable with killing people, and the mom is like, you know, expecting her to, and the dad is like, oh, she, the, her mom sends her to her room, mm-hmm. uh, and her dad is like, well, everybody's kind of squeamish about it at first, and I just didn't, it just didn't feel funny to me because I was just still thinking, well, we are talking about murder here. Um, <laughs> it's a little hard for me to laugh at it, but yeah. Yeah, I agree. And especially I think that in the first chapter she was trying to kill children, right? I mean. Yeah, or at least people her own age, uh, yeah. whatever that is. Well, because one of them is Jolene, who is kind of the other main character as far as we can tell. Uh, right. And Maggie was attracted to Jolene, uh, which mm-hmm. she then kind of embarrassed herself in that scene. Uh, but yeah, she was sent to kill Jolene and these others who are uh, in some way like acolytes or something to this god Phoebus. Yeah. Like, you know, Which kind is... of low level uh, acolytes, not clergy or anything, but maybe hoping to move in that direction. Yeah. And I guess Phoebus is the voice of a distant star or something like that, like a sentient star hmm. or something that is being called a God. And so they, yeah, it's interesting because when they first start talking about that God, I think that's the, there's that scene where she wants a food that's easier to grow and eat than corn. Right. She's tired of shucking it. Yeah. And they're like, well, why don't you ask Phoebus about it? And she said, I can do that. And then, and then she realizes she can like literally talk directly to this God and so, you know, that's her first request is to make food that tastes like turkey because turkey's better than corn or something like that. But, <laughs> you know, I think just, I mean, to zoom out for a second and just kind of look at the story as a whole, hmm. it is very interesting kind of world building. I can totally see how this was created through a dragon, a Dungeons and Dragons campaign because there's a whole lot of just world building and these characters mixing in with each other. And each of them comes from this totally different world. And I could see that happening very organically through a D and D campaign where somebody creates their own character and brings them to the, to the campaign. And then, you know, shares that character with the other people on the team. And, you know, so you get to know these other people from other different kind of worlds and stuff that, that all kind of, you know, fits with how this story feels to me. Mm -hmm. And also, let me say this, I think that D&D being now like a very popular and even almost a mainstream thing where like normal kids play it (laughs) is also very different from our generation, I think. Right. Yeah, you were totally a a geek who knew like three people and they they all played D&D. I, even I wasn't that much of a geek. I didn't really know anybody who, very well who played it. I never played it myself. Yeah, I, I knew a few people who played it around me as well. But it was, you know, I, I when I was a little kid, it was the satanic panic. And so, you know, D&D was like, my parents were very religious and they would never allow us to play anything even resembling D&D. So mm. I think like even Pokemon and Magic the Gathering were considered... <laughs> D and D adjacent, so we could, we could, we weren't allowed to play that. So, <laughs> I wanted to talk about the way that he's using color because on a lot of the pages, it's like just different shades of one color, like all different mm-hmm. shades of purple or whatever. Um, later, as it goes on, it starts to take in more colors, uh, but generally the coloring or the color palette kind of changes with the scenes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that worked, I thought. But then there were other cases where, well, like I marked in my notes, chapter three, the transition from page 19 to page 20. So uh, Maggie has fought this giant insect, and the predominant color on that page is pink. And she gets this insect to shrink back down to normal insect size. And you turn the page, and now the main color is green, but it's still the same scene. 
Uh, we yeah. haven't like jumped to a different place or time, and it. I guess that the ch- change in color from pink to green was to sh- maybe show that the the tension had decreased, that it wasn't a fight anymore. It was a more calmer scene, but doing that right in the middle of a scene felt a little awkward to me. Yeah, that that totally makes sense too, because I think I agree that obviously some of it is like mood markers and stuff like that. But I think definitely when the color palette completely changes, it tells your brain that you're, you've moved on to another scene. And so you have to kind of fight that urge with that. Yeah. It was too severe of a color change. I can certainly see changing the palette as the, the fight ends, but yeah, I think it needed to be something a little more gradual. There needed to be something to unify those two pages, even though the, the predominant kind of feeling of each page was different because it is still the same time and place. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's true. I, although I, I agree with what you were saying in the beginning as well, that this, the use of color is very well done for the most part. Mm -hmm. Um, and the colors are really pretty. They're very, they're flat. Um, there's not any gradients and there's not any, um, there's not even much shading or highlights. It's mostly just flat colors, but the colors are done in a really nice way where they complement each other. There's like these, you know, nice pinks that kind of, um, are complemented by these light blues in some scenes. Um, and the day and night kind of thing is is or like dark and light is done really well not with like blacks but with like you know purple hues and things like that and so i do feel like the colors are really really pretty to look at and they um they all go together really well i feel like this artist has a good sense of color theory Hmm. um and i do agree that the color the use of color and the sense of color improves a lot from the first book to I mean, the first chapter up to like the fourth and fifth, like it gets better as it goes. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would say that's true of the art in general. The art is very simplistic in the first chapter, Uh Um, even, even a bit crude or rough in some places. Yeah. And then it, it, by the fourth chapter, I would say it starts to look really well done. Um, The, the blocking, the movement of the camera um, angle and focus and just the actual like composition itself, like the, you know, the people's bodies and the backgrounds. Um, I do feel like there's either, the artist is either using some kind of a digital pattern or maybe digital references or something like that for the backgrounds, because some mm-hmm. of them look like they're based on photos or something, mm-hmm. but it's done in a way that it doesn't look tacky. Like it, it looks all of one particular aesthetic. So I would say that's true of even like the, that's true of the characters bodies as well. Like in the first chapter, you see the, the people basically all from the same angle. It's almost always a front shot. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, from the same distance from the camera as well, or from the point of view. And when you get to chapter four or so, you start to see characters from the back. You see them from like three quarter views. You see them from up and down and the body proportions and everything looks well done. So this, I would say as an artist, um, he's getting better and better as it, as the story goes for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If we go back and look at chapter one, uh, it is definitely, yeah, cause the other day I read, I think I got into chapter five, and then it sat for a few days, and then today I went back to the beginning and read, like, as far as somewhere in chapter four. And, yeah, when I went back to the beginning, like, wow, this is really rougher than than where I ended up. Yeah, and you don't notice it when you first start. It doesn't feel that rough when you start it. So that's a testament to the fact that the artist improved over time, because when you go back from after getting to chapter four or five, then you go back, then you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, there's a huge change. But um, there's no particular point throughout the story where you're like, oh, now the artist is better. It's like a very smooth transition. So. Right, yeah. 
But um, that's one one thing that I kind of like about uh, reviewing these. I don't want to say amateur in like a bad way, but like not professional works that are out there. These kind of independent works is that you get to see the artist improve both in terms of their, you know, mark making on the page, but also in their writing and they get more comfortable with their characters as they go so that the characters feel more natural, Mm -hmm. you know, things like that. So that's definitely apparent in this one. Yeah, mm -hmm, for sure. Uh, Did you say before we started recording that you had some trouble understanding what was happening at some points? Yes. um, Actually, fairly often. That's I thought about going back and reading from the beginning again because there were times where I wasn't exactly sure what was happening. But at the same time, you don't necessarily need to because the story, as long as you understand the basic part that you have this, you know, character Maggie who comes from this sort of sort of home that she wants to hide, right? Like she doesn't want to be a killer. She doesn't mm-hmm. want to be associated with her mother who everybody's afraid of. Um, and she doesn't really want to bring about the apocalypse. Um, and then you have this, and and then her being kind of confused and in love with, or, you know, attracted to this other character who she doesn't know how to gauge if that's reciprocal or not. Like when you kind of get the basic part of the story like that, then it all doesn't really matter the finer details of what's happening, you know, Mm -hmm. because it's more atmospheric, like them going through this adventure together in a sense. So, Hmm. yeah. Did you have the same thing? I I was curious. Did you? Um, Not really. I don't think I, I ever felt like I wasn't sure what was going on. Um, Although I don't know, whenever I read comics on my computer, I, I kind of start, struggling to stay awake and I get kind of lost a lot of times. Uh, but that's, that's my problem, not the comics. Uh, that very well could have been what happened to me because as I told you, I was up too late. I was up too late drinking and playing video games. And so when I did try to read this, I, I was guilty of falling asleep here and there. So, (laughs) which is, you know, not the fault of the comic at all. Yeah. Uh, or I start to feel like my brain is just kind of dead and I'm just looking at pictures and <laughs> not getting a story out of them at all. Yeah. I wonder if that's something else, that's something where younger readers can easily look at comics on a computer or on a phone and follow it easier than old guys like us. That's very possible. Maybe. I don't know. It de- it can depend on the type of storytelling, too. Uh, coming up in this episode, I'm going to be talking with Jason about an anthology comic. Uh, and I found in that, that it really depended on the writing and the art in the comic. Cause sometimes I was just like, I don't get this. And other times it's just, it just was really sharp. Like, okay, I see this is happening. This is happening. And it was all clear to me and I didn't have any trouble with it. But yeah. other times it was just like, is there even a story happening here? <laughs> um, and maybe it's just a, a generational difference between those creators and me who grew up with Marvel. Um, and before that, like, you know, funny comics, like from gold key or something. <laughs> That's yeah. how old I'm, I am. Gold key comics. <laughs> I've, I've definitely, I don't know if I was around when those were like coming out, but I've def I definitely have some of my collection. So, <laughs> Scooby-Doo and Bugs Bunny and all kinds of licensed characters. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, I thought that this was not bad. And yeah, the art is definitely improving as he goes. Yeah, I agree. It's not bad at all. Um, it's probably not what I would normally go towards. Like, it's not the kind of story that would attract me really, but... Um, but I enjoyed it and it's, you know, it, it's playful enough and it's the characters feel real enough that, um, it's, you know, it's kind of fun to occupy that space with them while you're reading the story. So I enjoyed it. Read the comic at cloverandcutlass.com. It's linked in the show notes. 
Coming up, Jason and I discuss the Wild West anthology, Coiled to Strike. First, just a reminder that you can help this podcast by making your Amazon purchases via deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon and make that your bookmark for future purchases. Deconstructing Comics earns a bit of money from your purchase that helps us keep the show going. We really appreciate your support. Edward and Alphonse Elric, as a result of attempting the forbidden act of resurrecting their mother with alchemy, have paid the price. Edward lost an arm and a leg. Alphonse lost his whole body, his soul now attached to a suit of armor. Together they search for a way to make their bodies complete again and uncover a deadly plot by their country's military rulers. That's the concept of Hiromu Arakawa's Fullmetal Alchemist, one of the best manga ever made. Tim and Patrick are rereading Arakawa's masterwork in search of interesting sound effects, translation errors, goofy humor, and, oh yeah, a great story. The podcast is The Law of Equivalent Exchange, a chapter-by-chapter look at the manga Fullmetal Alchemist. New episodes every other Monday, wherever podcasts are found. What are you willing to exchange? Okay, I'm back, and now I'm with Jason in Portland. Well, I'm not in Portland, but Jason's in Portland. Hi. But you're still allowed in Portland, right? After the uh, after the incident? Uh, yeah, I might have to sneak in, but... <laughs> I think everything's been squared away. You're always welcome back. It was just a misunderstanding last time. <laughs> okay. I haven't been there. I was there, what, seven? It's been seven years ago already. I can't believe it. Well, they put a plaque up at that cheap hotel you stayed at. <laughs> right, yeah, you saw the place I was staying. You, you told me later it was a terrible neighborhood. You're lucky you didn't. You woke up with both kidneys. <laughs> <laughs> I drive past that place. And I, I drive a little faster so I don't get caught anywhere near it. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is an anthology called Coiled to Strike. Uh, and I heard from... Akira Brown, the CEO of Wildstar Press, that was that's putting this out. Um, I have to apologize to Akira because we didn't get this critique done sooner. It kind of slipped through the cracks. Um, they were doing a Kickstarter in April, um, which fell pretty far short. I don't think we could have given them that much juice to to make up for that. But uh, anyway, we're finally getting to it. Sorry for the delay. Sorry, we ruined your Kickstarter. <laughs> it's all our fault. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the book is called Coiled to Strike. Uh, all of the stories are about a character, an outlaw in the Old West uh, called Emery Graves. Uh, and the blurb says, a smart man will tell you it's best not to cross an angry viper. A wise man will tell you that the viper with devil horns is named Emery Graves and is the most dangerous of them all. Um, and so on. Uh, and uh, so Emery Graves, the character design is kind of set. All of the artists are following this character design. Uh, but, Apparently, they've left the character's gender kind of up for debate, or it's kind of the the creator's choice. Because in many of them, Emery is a they-them, but in several, it's a guy, it's he, and, and there was one where Emery was she. Uh, so it seems to be like... And it, the blurb talks about like no one truly knows who or what Emery Graves is, uh, and so I guess that includes gender, uh, which like is kind that. of interesting. Yeah, so I, was I really, I really like that touch. It's just, so you know, and, and as tales change, the genders are going to change. Who's who's telling the story? Um, they're always a a person of color, right? Yeah, the the character design is clearly this kind of this black kind of androgynous looking uh, person with a cowboy hat. Uh, and kind of what braids or dreadlocks? I think they're braids. They seem to be braids. Um, and uh, so, yeah, kind of, the design kind of just, you know works regardless of what gender you assign to Emery. And even yeah, in every story, even when he's um, they use um, male pronouns for the character, he's not like beefed up. Like he always has the same silhouette. He's always got like a slight frame, mm-hmm. um, and it's a good character design. 
we should also say that the book is in grayscale. The book is not in color. Yeah, and there were a few uh, stories where I kind of felt like it must have been, it looked like it might have been done in color originally, because in the black and white, it looked, uh, some of the, a couple of the stories looked kind of muddy, like I couldn't quite figure out what was going on. Yeah, Jason's holding up his tab, holding it up on his tablet. Um, yeah, there's one page where it's really, really muddy. It's not going to print well. Um I think some of these were done in Procreate. I, I've seen art come out of Procreate where the values are just a little bit, a little bit too dark. You looking at the Sunday's Best Friend story? What the horse? Where the horse is the focus? It, it, yeah, Sunday's Best Friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, most of the stories don't have that problem. They were really done, done to work in black and white. But that one, I felt like it was probably intended to be in color. I oh, agree. Um, I, I mean, you know, I'm, I love stories in the old West during the sort of American expansion. And I feel it's, it's really part of the American identity that we are going to go and expand, uh, through this land just go West and prosper sort of ideology. But we're also, obviously we are taking resources from people that are already here. Um, uh, but it's sort of like baked into the American identity that you go West to find yourself. And to some degree that is still the case. Like I definitely grew up in the East coast and moved to the West coast. Yeah. Uh, there's, there is this idea that you go West to find yourself and define yourself so that this character is out there still defining themselves. I find is really interesting. Uh, and the characterization Viper, they also go by Viper, by the way, mm-hmm. right? That's their other, uh, non deplore. And sometimes they travel with a, a pet Viper. And sometimes they do like very heroic things. Like the tale is they're a hero and they save children from a burning fire. And then a couple stories later, they're a hired killer. And they've got a mark and they and they kill someone in cold blood because they were paid mm-hmm. to. And I just love the idea that this character doesn't have to be consistent in the same way that American myths and folklore are not consistent. Right? These stories mm-hmm. probably mean different things to everyone who's telling them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that one surprised me where the person is, uh, I think it was a, a boy who's crying at a grave and cursing Emery, and then Emery shows up, uh, and the boy almost kills Emery, and, but can't bring himself to shoot. Uh, but I was, yeah, I was a little surprised by that, because in other stories, Emery was didn't seem to be a killer. I mean, it, he, Emery has a good side for sure. Uh, and he does good deeds in some of these stories. He, they, um, but, but they're uh, also a joyful, they're not a dark character. They're very joyful. They do everything, a big smile on their face. Uh-huh. Um, they're very broad. Um, the story I'm thinking in particular is called the midnight run. Mm. And there's a character named Donna who else goes by Don. Uh, who at the end is executed by this character, who in all the other incarnations is a very affable outlaw, like a loving outlaw, yeah. one step mm-hmm. ahead, almost like the Dukes of Hazard, right? Like you just got to, <laughs> you got to love them. Uh, you got to love them. But uh, in that one, I was like, that's interesting. And it, but it all works within the context of this is an ever shifting character. And I think of like uh, these Greek characters, or these old sort of myths where sometimes these characters, like their, their gender is fluid. Sometimes they appear as one gender, sometimes they appear as another, and that's just legend, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, my two favorites, and I don't know if it was necessarily because of the story, but maybe it was, but I thought they were well-written and drawn. But one was the Grizzly Sabotage by Bite Ghost, uh, where Emery is cornered, uh, their horse is shot, uh, there's no way to move forward. There's a big canyon uh, up ahead, and then their pursuers say, "Okay, well he's we we've got him." And then Emery comes out riding a grizzly bear, and not only that, but steals the money bag off of one guy and replaces it with a bag of dirt. Uh, right. So. Emery comes out ahead in the end. And then also uh, Viper Snare by Robin E., uh, where some guys are looking for a horse thief, and apparently Emery is the thief, and they find the horse, and they find Emery, and Emery's like, okay, you got me. And then somehow they're they're tricked. Yeah, he's... 
they've laid some traps for these guys, and the next thing you know, Emery has captured them, and they're <laughs> tied up and on the horse, and Emery is turning them as, as the horse thieves, uh, yeah. along with the horse. Well, we want a character that like outsmarts people, right? We want to we want to root for a character that uses their brain. Emery is not like a big hulking figure. He's not going to fight five or six cowboys, right? He's going to use guile, or they're going to use guile uh, to win the day. So I like that about this character. They are not. Um, they're going to outsmart. Mm-hmm. So that was good. Let's talk about the art. I think even though we, there was some of the some of the chapters, some of the pages look a little darker. That I would like. I'd say all the art is, is pretty good. It's it's mm-hmm. as good or it's it's at a you know a beginning level professional level. Maybe the art wise, the weakest story might be the first one. Yeah, when I saw that one, I ha- I hadn't quite absorbed that it was an anthology yet, and I think, oh gee, the whole book is like this. And but uh, then I realized, oh, okay, there are other artists work here. But yeah, that one was a little sketchy. But you you put that one first. You know, yeah. I'll, I, it reminds me actually of one of my students uh, in my graphic novel class. Um, all of these look like young artists, but each of them has a, a distinct and unique style. Each of them has mm-hmm. a, a voice. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes the lettering is a little like right out of the box, Clip Studio ish, but they'll get there. I think I, you know, I really root for the upstarts for the people that are doing it themselves. And I think if you're a young emerging artist, all these stories are like six, seven pages, right? Maybe nine at yeah, most. Yeah, none of them get very long. What, what, what a low a low ask. If you're asking an artist to contribute to an anthology, you know, six to eight pages, you could do that in your spare time. And all of these look pretty good. There was nothing here. I was not concerned for anyone here. I thought all this art um, – it's just really well done. I'm really, I'm kind of really curious how they, they found these artists. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. The story, the midnight run by beat B E E T. Um, I thought the art was fine, but it was too talky and there were word balloons all over the place, kind of covering up the art. Uh, I thought that, uh, beat needed to, uh, either reduce the amount of dialogue or, do more pages i don't know um, yeah I, I, I would agree because the art is beautiful actually it's very uh expressionistic but it's, it's very dramatic too there's a beautiful splash page in there yeah i would agree um a less less might have been a little bit more here with the dialogue mm-hmm. but yeah I, I didn't think any of these were really bad i mean and there weren't many points where I struggled to figure out what was going on. There was one story where I didn't quite get the ending, uh, the calamity of Calypso Creek. Uh, I got confused at the end, even when I reread it, like, okay, so I don't quite know who these people are and how many different groups of people are there in this scene. And uh, yeah, I, I didn't grasp what was going on. I don't know if I made it to that one. Oh, the art's on page f- 59 of the PDF. Yeah, I made it through the 40s. I made it just before that one. Okay. That's a good artist, though, on that one. Yeah, a lot. Of, some of these just have a lot of extra text, and that's just a young a young storyteller thing. Uh, I think, you know, a successful, art, a successful comic book should work without even looking at the words, without any text. You should kind of get the feel of it and the idea of it. Um, yeah, I was, I was, uh, I'm sorry they didn't make it, and I hope they don't give up. Uh, and maybe the difference is a color edition might attract more eyes. Yeah, I, I think it's it's worth publishing. I hope it does uh, get out there somehow. I'm not sure if they're selling digital editions or if it, if everything hinged on the the Kickstarter. Well, you could probably um, if you give the files out, you know, that you can make a small print run for a couple hundred dollars. But the idea is you want to drive down the per unit price by printing a thousand. Plus, you have you know eighteen or like a dozen contributors in there. You have to give each of them copies. But the upside to an anthology is all those people can prom- ideally should be able to promote it. Um, so when I promote a book, it's just me and the artist. You've got twelve artists in there, or maybe more. Um, ideally. All those all those voices could amplify and get this thing done. So I wouldn't give up on this uh, at all. 
And I would encourage them maybe to just spend out of pocket and print a, a hundred or so copies just to bring to conventions and show people what you've done. Um, but yeah, I would encourage all of the artists in there to even take their individual samples and send them out to companies. And this is a good calling card for young artists and for a young team. And I just think it was a good collection. I, I was, I was really, I'm going to finish it tonight. Hmm. Well, yeah, I was, I was, maybe I won't spoil it for you, but the story of Vanishing Horizons was, was interesting. It gets a, a little supernatural. Some of these stories, uh, are completely based in the, the real world, let's say. Uh, but, yeah, I don't, want the, I don't want the real world. Or the, the real world, uh, re- reality is cheap. <laughs> because anyone anyone could do it. There was the one about the vanishing stars. Uh, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, the, in, in some stories, the Viper has sort of supernatural powers or mm-hmm. good good luck yeah, energy, or you know, might have supernatural powers. It's you know, the legend thing. It's all vague. You know, could be that the Viper has powers. Um, it looked like it to so and so who told me this. <laughs> well, I thought it had a great charm. And I, I wish them well with the project. And I think if there's a digital version out there through the Kickstarter, I imagine you can – often if you uh, uh, visit a Kickstarter, the link will pull you towards a, a store afterwards. So I would encourage people if they're looking for a – if they like Westerns uh, and they like a character, you know, this supernatural type character, this mythical type character that's open to interpretation, um, you know, you're going to read it and you're going to have your own interpretation. So I, I was quite happy with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, read it if you can find it. Um, I'll I'll link to their Kickstarter page. Uh, maybe track maybe it down and help you it. track it down. Yeah, and uh, give a couple bucks to some emerging cartoonists because there was a lot of care and and thought into this. And I do think it's I, I like revisiting the 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 West and sort of maybe updating the identity of the America needs updating. And I think going back to the old West is a good way to do it. Mm-hmm. Find out more about Coiled to Strike at wildstarpress.com or search Kickstarter for Coiled to Strike. Both links are in the show notes. Thanks to our patrons for supporting Deconstructing Comics and our other podcasts. To join them, go to patreon.com slash deconcomics. At deconstructingcomics.com, you can connect to us on X, Facebook, or YouTube. Follow the link to shop at Amazon to support the show and find links to subscribe to the podcast. You can comment on any episode on our site or drop us a line at mail at deconstructingcomics.com. And now you can also send us a voicemail. Find the Leave a Voicemail link on the left sidebar of our site. Are you making a comic? Send it to us and we'll do a Critiquing Comics episode about it. Our theme is from bensound.com. Okay, we've made you wait long enough. Next week on Deconstructing Comics, it's time for some more Jack Kirby. Emmett joins me to discuss the first four issues of The Eternals. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Critiquing Comics. <laughs>